Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 528th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, the Programs Associate here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation on the event of Artwork, how the government-funded CETA Jobs Program put artists to work um, at City Lore until April 10th now, um, extended. And our conversation today features Ted Berger, Ma Molly Garfinkel, Joan Snitzer, Nitsa Tufino, Jody Weinberg, and Bob Holman as our host and closing poet. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a working document of resources and actions. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at the Rail. Please check the chat in a moment for more information. Um, and now I'll introduce um, our wonderful host and guests. Um, Bob Holman is an American poet and po poetry activist and is equal parts spoken word performer, professor, impresario, activist, proprietor of the Bowery Poetry Club, filmmaker, and host of Language Matters. A contributor to the Brooklyn Rail, he is also the author of 17 poetry collections. Ted Berger is executive director emeritus of the New York Foundation for the Arts and has helped to create many national and local initiatives, including Arts Connection, Studio in a School, and the NYC CETA Artists Project. Molly Garfinkel serves as co-director of City Lore and the director of City Lore's Place Pro Matters program, leading initiatives related to cultural resource management, historic preservation, public history, exhibition curation, public education, and traditional arts presentation. Joan Snitzer is an artist and the director of the visual arts program in the Department of Art History at Barnard College and has held this position since 2001. Nitsa Tufino is an artist and has that has been committed to public art since the 1970s and is a proud member of El Consejo Gráfico, a national co coalition of Latino printmaking workshops and individual printmakers. And Jody Weinberg is the executive director of Artists Alliance Inc., a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting the careers of emerging and underrepresented artists and curators through residencies, exhibitions, and commissioned projects. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Bob, to get us going. Thanks very much, Carolyn, and hello, everybody, in your little anti-Hollywood squares as we attempt to Zoomsterama this uh, incredible uh, gathering. Um, just a, a couple of things about Carolyn's intro. One is that the exhibit is uh, not only at City Lore, but also at the magnificent Cucci Fritos Gallery down at the Essex, Essex Street Market. You gotta go down to both of these places, spend your day downtown and, uh, and see the photographic uh, diary of the Extraordinary CETA Artists Project. Um, and also, that the, the, the thing that was left out of my little one-liner one and Nietzsche's is that we both were CETA artists. And that right. gets left out too many times. We all do it. You know, this was an extraordinarily formative moment, the largest federally funded artist program since the WPA, and who knows about it? And right now is the moment to know about it because we're starting finally to have a little bit of... Uh, of put the artists to work, which we wanted, what else do we want to do? You know, the, so uh, this is why we get to be here today. And thanks to uh, Carolyn, Nick and Fong and Ellen and Eleanor and everybody else um, for letting us be here and doing it. Um, so where to start? Well, like, unlike usual, we start thought maybe we should start with the beginning, which was Ted Berger's brain. And, uh, and as all, and the collaborators are going to get all due credit because all due credit is the definition of poetry, in case you were looking for that. Um, and then we'll go right over to uh, 
to uh, the, the, the galleries, you know, and, and to uh, Molly and Jody and, and, uh, and talk about the, the, you know, what has actually caused this, uh, this, this blossom. Okay, so here he is, my mentor and everybody's boyfriend, Ted Berger. Um, so th thank you, Bob, and hi, everybody. And thanks for be being with us. Um, so in the beginning, I mean, I'm an old guy, but I assure you, I, I didn't really know Methuselah. Adam and Eve, maybe, you know, that, et cetera, but I, I, I've been around some. And I'm sure Molly and Jody are gonna get into this uh, as well. But as I recall the beginning, at least from a New York perspective, um, there was this guy, John Kreidler in California in about 1974, saw this legislation and was involved with a, a, an initiative called Neighborhood Arts. John um, said, this is gonna work for artists. And he, he simply took the Comprehensive Employment Training Act legislation and said, we can give jobs to artists. I had just joined NIFA in August of 1973. So when, when as it, the, the country's first artists and schools coordinator for a state, um, when, when John got this project off the ground in San Francisco, word like this spread throughout the country. It was like wildfire. Because one of the things about CETA as opposed to WPA, it was a decentralized program allowing every community to determine how it wanted to shape it, okay. I, I was just starting out in this field and I was trying to learn what the hell, who did what to whom. And I, um, and I met some key people, Sarah Garretson, who was then the head of the extant Cultural Council Foundation and our beloved friend, um, Cheryl McClenney. Cheryl was the assistant commissioner at a, a new agency in the city, which had been separated out from the mayor's office called the Department of Cultural Affairs. And the three of us started to meet and say, well, other parts of the country are doing something. What the hell are we going to do in New York? And we tried to figure out what might be possible. These, these monies were coming through the Department of Labor. And we were being told in, by city government, your, your sector, your community is a fractious one. It's a dysfunctional one. We will only listen to you if you speak in one voice and, and you, that you come as a united proposal. So Sarah, uh, Cheryl and I looked at us and we said, looked at each other and said, good luck trying to organize our community. I mean, you know what that's about. And, and we did. And what you also have to remember, which is key, both for the country and for what it meant in New York City at the time, and I'll shut up in a, in a minute, is this was the 70s. And a lot of people had come to the arts imbued with the spirit of the 60s. That there was a sense that, with, that we could really change the world. And we had the answers to everything, but it was growing out of a civil rights movement. It was growing out of a gender issues. It was growing out of a, a spirit of activism that people were still wanting to fight and make things happen. And the arts community was just getting going. While, while some organizations had been around forever, NISCA was just getting going the endowment was just getting going. DCLA had a new, uh, new, new perspective. And it was a moment 
when people wanted to build a community and they wanted to strengthen emerging organizations and give space for new voices and new ideas. And CETA came at that moment. And I believe it's one of the <clears throat> reasons in many ways it, it is more critical that we understand what worked with CETA, what didn't work with CETA than it is WPA. Because it tells more about what could be ahead for the future than WPA, which was a, a national program did, however important WPA is. So I, I'll stop now. Beautiful, Ted, thank you. Applauso. Um, so that, that's the stage. CETA, which was a, uh, a, a federal program to put the, what I call terminally unemployable, retrain us and put us to work, which was across all sectors of the population, not just artists. It, artists, are, as Ted was saying, were one small fraction of what was going on with CETA. But we think of it as the CETA Artists Project and was, you know, the, is the sort of a model for where things can proceed in the future, which includes the fact that artists are workers, let's face it. And here was a place that put us to work right in the communities. The communities uh, are represented really well in the, in the current exhibitions that are uh, on view at City Lore and at the Cuchifritos Gallery. So now Molly Garfinkel and Jody Weinberg are gonna take us through how they came to, this, to do this now and what it is, uh, and what it is, there it is. Okay, thanks. Um, hi everybody, thank you all so much for being here and thank you so much to the Brooklyn Rail for coordinating this. Um, and thank you to all of the folks on this panel. It has been just a really tremendous honor to be able to work with you on this project, to get to learn this history from you. We absolutely couldn't have done this without your support, your wisdom, your lived experience, um, and with your um, understanding and belief that this could happen again or something like this could happen again. Um, so I'm, I'm uh, the co-director at City Lore and uh, co-curator along with Jody Weinberg, my wonderful friend from Artist Alliance Inc. of the exhibition artwork, how the government funded CETA Art Jobs Program put artists to work as Bob mentioned. Um, and just to give a little bit of background on CETA and how we came to this. So CETA was the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act. It was legislation that was enacted by Richard Nixon's administration in 1973 in response to simultaneously rising rates of unemployment and inflation. And CETA was an employment program. I think that's really important uh, to, to mention. It was an employment and training program, unlike the WPA to which it is sometimes compared and which had federal project one specifically for artists, as both Ted and Bob have already said, CETA did not include any special provisions for artists. But through the ingenuity of the arts community and first uh, John Kreidler in San Francisco, across the country, 10,000 artists and 10,000 cultural workers, including administrators, security staff, archivists, and more, received, received salary jobs through CETA. And in New York City, there were five significant CETA arts contracts. The largest of these went to the Cultural Council Foundation, which uh, both Ted and Bob have also already mentioned. The CCF was a pre-existing private nonprofit service, sort of service organization, a fiscal agent for community cultural organizations on whose behalf they received and managed grant money. So there was sort of a bank and a bookkeeper and a parent for those organizations, if you will. Um, when CETA monies in New York were finally made available to artists in 1977, the CCF won the contract to administer what became the largest CETA arts project in the world, um, in the country and thus the world, with 300 artists and a $4.5 million budget. And in the second year of the project, it was actually expanded to employ 325 artists. I actually first learned about CETA in 2011 from Bob, um, who, as you know, is a CETA artist. Um, and I was working with Bob on a poetry project where he mentioned um, that with a great gusto and enthusiasm, his CETA experience, and I had studied the WPA, but I'd never heard of CETA. And Bob at that time was already trying to rally support to revive the history and to sort of advocate for the creation of something similar uh, for artist employment in New York City. 
So fast forward to 2017, through a series of encounters at City Lore, we decided to pursue CETA as a research topic with the support of Bob and Ted, an advisory committee that we assembled, which includes several of the CCF architects and administrators, as well as a number of the photographers from the program, which is an important point, I think. Um, and that's because unlike the WPA, as has already been mentioned, CETA was totally decentralized. The legislation was designed to distribute money from the federal government to states and localities to what were known as prime sponsors. Some of this was to do with Nixon's goal of shifting power from DC, but CETA's architects also recognized that local places might have a better sense of what their actual labor force needs are, what their economic uh, development, skills, innovation, and community needs are. So from a research perspective, the decentralization means that documentation is spread across the country and was done unevenly if it was done at all and is often sort of hidden in plain sight in repositories and personal collections where sometimes it's not referenced as CETA related at all. And so while there were many, many titles under CETA, it was Title VI, which was public service employment, meaning job placements working in the service of community, of the public, that artists were able to get funded uh, through CETA, or largely in the country. So there are just tons of community-based organizations that sponsored CETA artists, who were first staffed by CETA cultural workers, or were even founded with CETA monies, but there's no centralized record of what was accomplished, who went where, and what remains. So the CCF CETA Artist Project had the very brilliant idea of creating its own documentation unit, which included three photographers. As I mentioned, our advisory committee has uh, several photographers on it, as well as three writers and an archivist. And the work that they produced was compiled and archived and donated to the New York City Municipal Archives, where it's made publicly accessible. There are about 70 bankers boxes completely full to the brim with all kinds of material, including photographs, oral history cassettes that were taken during the program and piles and piles of ephemera and paperwork that was produced and collected by CCF during CETA. And this is really important because it's an incredible, almost comprehensive, if you will, treasure trove of primary source material that showed the breadth and depth of the CCF CETA artist project's positive impact on the city, of the program's positive impact on participating artists, and the incredible effort that it took to develop and manage this project. Thanks very much to Ted and Sarah Garretson and Sharon McClenney, um, and then uh, project director Rochelle Sloven, and uh, many of the administrative staff, including Joan Snitzer, who was on the job development program. Um, and this ultimately, they collected all this material because they really wanted to show the future, show us what could and should be done. Um, and also because they had to be accountable to the regulations implemented by the Federal Department of Labor. And this is another, again, just to put a really fine point on it, critical point that CETA was a jobs and training program. It was not a grant program. And these jobs were not maybe necessarily meant to be forever, but they came with a lot of benefits, including a living wage and benefits, vacation time, healthcare, et cetera. And so what's interesting is that the New York City project was one of the last places to get a CETA art, New York City was one of the last places to get a CETA artist project because as Ted mentioned, it took so much work to get buy-in from the political sector, from uh, various city agencies to build that political support, to build a coalition within the arts and artists community, and to build a support structure for the artists employed by CCF. And from the start, this was always just a very fascinating and important concept to me uh, for what is possible in treating artists like workers, which they are. So in tandem with archival research, we organized a reunion for CCF CETA artists and administrators in 2018 at City Lore. Um, and using um, what I call the red book, I, I don't know if you all can see this, sort of a yearbook that was published by CCF toward the end of its lifespan, we contacted hundreds of people who had been involved with the program. About 70 attended and many more uh, wrote from as far as Alaska and Rome and Martinique, saying how wonderful their CETA experiences had been and how they wished they could attend the reunion and they expressed their support and wishes to be involved moving forward. So with that, we really knew that this was something really tremendous that the history of which had to be uncovered again, sort of as a, as a stepping stone for the future. 
Um, and in 2019, we reached out to Jody Weinberg and Artist Alliance Inc. to collaborate with us on an exhibition highlighting this history. And AAI is such a wonderful partner for City Lore on this project because their work is so complementary to our community-based arts and arts education work. AAI provides individual artists with studio space and support and runs the Cuchifritos Gallery in Essex Market. And together, our missions sort of form a Venn diagram that seeks to address <laughs> at least some of what CCFC to Artist Project was built to accomplish. Um, and I will stop talking now and pass it off to Jody Weinberg, my wonderful co-curator for this exhibition. Thank you. And I just want to reiterate Molly's thanks to all of you for this opportunity to have this conversation. Um, so I first just want to clarify one thing that unfortunately the Cruci Fritos portion of this exhibition has actually closed. So if you do visit us at Cucci Fritos, I promise to talk your ear off about this exhibition. Um, however, it only really lives on in photos, which you can see right now. Um, but I do want to sort of get into a little bit of the background of how we developed the project um, to be a visual experience, to take up sort of shared and public space. Um, and the truth is that Molly and I considered a number of ways to tell this story. There are so many individuals who played such critical roles in the New York CCF CETA program um, that we really did sort of go back and forth between multiple perspectives um, and did our best to talk to different stakeholders to understand um, which stories really needed to be told and which stories really felt sort of missing from this history. And over the course of those conversations, we just kept coming back to the overwhelming awareness that the history of CETA was still relatively absent from larger art historical conversations, um, despite the fact that the practices of the New York program have very deep roots and have had profound influences on many of the artistic practices and institutions that so many of us know today. Um, but because of Molly's very extensive research into public archives, including the municipal archives of the city of New York, her years spent interviewing individuals who are a part of and contributed to CETA in New York, and the absolute generosity of the CCF documentation unit photographers, which Molly has already mentioned, um, we really had a wealth of archival material from which to develop the exhibition and ultimately decided to focus on that material in order to tell this initial story um, with the hope and understanding that this is just the first of many opportunities to talk about the influence of CETA both in New York City and as a part of a much larger national project. Um, and so given all of this, Molly and I really decided to shape the show in a way that could reflect the values and the structure of the CCF Artist Project as an institution that was shaped around a set of fundamental principles. Um, and those principles were really that a diverse cultural workforce, when provided with necessary resources, can have a profound influence on the health and well-being of communities that the skills and practices of cultural workers do have the ability to generate economic value and that caring for the whole person has an enduring positive influence on creative practices. And so with the material available, which includes, and I hope you visit the exhibition at City Lore and experience all of this in person, um, documentary footage, hundreds of program and studio photos, application materials, and letters of gratitude and support from partner institutions, we really wanted to underscore the community that was cultivated within the CCF program. And for us, that community really was between artists who often became collaborators and lifelong friends. I'm sure you'll hear much more about that today. Um, between artists and the actual program administrators, many of whom were artists themselves, and so could bring a very specific type of sympathy and empathy to the work that they were doing to support the program. And between the CCF community and community beneficiaries, also known as community sponsors. And, um, and this feels a bit more like the enduring legacy between the cultural community that was supported with CETA funding and the larger public service workforce. Um, and really that was part of the CETA legacy that we've discussed at length um, in sort of the later part of the project. As Molly mentioned, we did start to develop this before the pandemic, um, but in 2020, when everything was shut down by COVID, um, I think for many of us in the cultural community, the vulnerability of our peers and colleagues um, was really highlighted by the economic and professional losses that sort of occurred as an after effect of the pandemic. Um, and so um, we really want to, sorry, um, we feel very strongly that this, this program has a particular resonance at this moment, 
um, really as the field seems to be confronting the often precarious nature of creative careers and openly discusses the new forms of sustainability. So our hope really in mounting these projects at this particular moment um, was one, of course, that we can resurrect this incredibly significant history that was somehow lost, um, but also create an opportunity for those of us who work in the field now to sort of instigate bigger conversations around sustainability and long-term support for all cultural workers, um, not just one portion of the sector and how that really does intersect with larger conversations of labor and the American workforce. Well, wow. Um, there you have it, folks. You guys can really talk. And uh, that was a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, thorough, uh, you know, explanation of what, uh, of what CETA is and seen through the eyes of these marvelous um, urban uh, uh, historians and explorers. Um, I think it's time to turn to, uh, to Nietzsche and get an art, artist's perspective of this. All the way from Borinqua, our, our dear- Borinque. Gracias. Borinque. All the way from Borinque. Borinque. Go ahead, Nietzsche, take over. Listen, this was, uh, uh, this was really great because for the first time as being an artist, I was in the labor force. Artists are artists, but they are part of the labor force. And this was the first time that uh, this, this organization, in the first way, the, the way that I, got in, that I got involved in it was because my mentor was Bob Blackburn, who had the pre-making workshop on 17th Street. So he asked me that he wanted me, I mean, I asked him what it was about. And he says, we're about making art and I'm working with the community. This I want you to I want you to make an application. The other person was um, Alice Neal that was part of the project, and uh, it was really fantastic. So I applied to it. I went for an interview, and all of that. And they explained uh, to all the artists. They finally they chose all the artists, and they got us all together with the commissioner that was Henry Getzeller. And I knew Gesteller because he had come to Puerto Rico a couple of times and he was very involved in some of the uh, uh, projects that we had done with El Museo del Barrio because he was a curator for the Metropolitan Museum before he became a commissioner. So it was really great that I was accepted into it because all of a sudden when I walked in there, I see performance, I see artists that were in performance, poetry, I met Pedro Pietri in there, I mean, it was fantastic. So, and then I met other muralists, like I was a muralist that we were for years trying to work together, but it was really very difficult. So I met Lucy Maller. And when I met Lucy Maller, I said, oh, let's work together. Let's see what we could do. So we started working. Hey, Nietzsche, with, uh, let me interrupt for just a minute. By meeting, I think you, uh, Nietzsche means we actually met um, every uh, two weeks on Fridays to pick up our paychecks. 300 right. gathered. And that was when this extraordinary sense of uh, collaboration and I don't know, empowerment's a big word, but boy, did we have a nice party when we picked up our paychecks. And, uh, and these kind of uh, connections that Nietzsche's talking about is what was really the infrastructure of the artist's viewpoint of CETA. We did, of course, have these guys who were actually doing the work on top, most of whom were artists themselves. And uh, that was, it was such an economy. Yeah, because we could work together. We could visit our studios. We work with the communities. We also, we, you know, it was really fantastic. What was really amazing is that, uh, you know, and we also helped with CSF, you know, like looking at uh, sites and stuff like that maybe some of the artists knew about it. So we, we you know, it was a whole collaboration and collective effort. And uh, we started, I wanted to experiment because I was a mural and I love to paint, but I wanted to make things more uh, permanent. So I started experimenting in, in ceramics. So, uh, which it was really great because I would have, if, if I'm not in there, uh, I would have never given, be given the opportunity 
to experiment, you know, and, you know, and to see creation and see what you could do and stuff like that. And from that, you know, that's when I did the Third Street Music School in the Lower East Side. Beautiful. And that was my first public art mural that was fabricated in ceramics, also with the other artist, Lucy Maller. So that gave me that ability. And from then, people started knowing who I was. And then I started, uh, when, when the government came out with the policy, but it was because of CEDA, that they did percent for the arts. So you have to compete with all the artists for commissions. So I started competing, uh, uh, competing for commission for the train station, for hospitals, for libraries, and, all, and I started winning them because I was able to experiment in the CETA Artist Project in the Lower East Side. I was given a studio with Lucy and we were able to work. And also um, the university, the Kingsborough University, because we didn't have a bigger space during the summer, they would give us the space and we were able to use their kilns and stuff like that. So really it was an effort for the community for us to do all this work. And then at time we would do stuff with the poets, uh, with Pedro, I did stuff with Pedro. We would do stuff in the senior centers uh, with the dancers, you know, we do uh, a scenography, you know, so it was really truly a collaboration. It was really exciting. And uh, then all of a sudden, it went, it, you know, we, we weren't doing anything anymore because there was no more funding. But an artist is always an artist. No matter what happens, you're going to keep on doing the work. <laughs> right, Bob? So. That is so right. Nisi, you, you, really caught, you really got the spirit of what was going on there. Remember that we had every week, four days a week were for the work for the community. One day a week was given to us to be our studio day. So, right. uh, you know, I mean, not only do we get paid for going out and, and working at uh, the Henry Street Settlement at the, at the Staten Island Children's Museum, but we also got paid to stay home and do our work one day a week. So, it was, uh, it, you know, there was just a, such a, a, a flow. And, and while Nisa was learning about different forms of art, what I was learning secretly was that I could be an arts administrator, even though I would never have admitted that in CETA, where I was a pure artist. The second I got out, I started working for the St. Mark's Poetry Project and then the New Eureka Poets Cafe. And then I started the Bowery Poetry Club. And believe me, none of that would have happened if I hadn't had the training I had in CETA to understand that every organization wants an artist on the payroll. They just can't pay them. You know, so that's where the, the federal government uh, comes in. And, and, and Nisa, if it's OK, I'm going to, you know, we're all going to join in. I see George Malave is here, one of the oh, great George. photographers, so crucial to documenting yeah, uh, the seed of thing. Thank you, George. And uh, but let's go to, to Joan Snitzer now, whose work continues to be with uh, um, art and labor and who was a marvelous along with charles bernstein uh administrator there at uh, the at at at, at CETA in nyc take it away joan okay hi thank you um yes i want to say something about my impression i was an artist hired as an administrator in a group called job development and what we really did was research how artists support themselves in new york city and what they wanted from their future and their um, careers as artists in all disciplines. And we met with each artist individually all day long. I had meetings and I heard their dreams and their hopes and their problems. And I took notes and I was a very young person, but it absorbed through me the need to connect. One thing I'd want to stress now, when you think about artists and great art, they always have somewhere support and an audience. This myth that an artist can go off by themselves and somehow brilliant ideas come into their head doesn't really exist. CETA gave artists in New York City a sense of respect and purpose, a structure, an audience, and a desire to make better work. And I think some of the artists that were involved could um, back me up on this. It's really critical to create a community that's communicating to a community. 
and to respect that community and to in respect in the sense of this program was to provide some employment, some actual income as an artist. And I think that seems like very practical, but it's also very psychological. And I think we overlook that aspect that that's critical in developing artists um, work and career and making that work better. When you know that you have to wake up in the morning, somebody's waiting to see what you've developed. Somebody's going to have a communication with that development. You want to get up earlier and make better work. It just happens that way. The second thing that I want to say, which was my observation in CETA, was there was a kind of natural diversity in the program, not a cosmetic one. And there were a lot of different cultures represented, different nationalities in the artist program themselves and the communities they had outreach to and, and worked with. Some of that has to do with the 70s were a period of bankruptcy in New York City and housing and a studio space and practice space was also very affordable. So it didn't become a city of only the rich that could afford to be here. It was a city of natural flow from different cultures and diversity. And I think moving forward, that would need to be considered and it didn't need to be considered then. I think my rent was $125 a month. I think the seed, uh, uh, Bob, do you remember what the salary was for a year? 10 or $12,000? Yeah. And you could, you could live on that. You actually yeah. live on that. So yeah. 10,000 bucks. That yeah. was the fortune. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's remarkable. And I think when we move forward and think about how to construct programs, the respect is first. And then uh, the value of being open and diverse because people can afford to be here and how that will play into it. The other thing I want to say about my experience at CETA was a lot of it was orientation, helping artists understand how artists make art and you know acquire and cultivate an audience. And we set a, a series of programs together, my group, inviting the so called successful artists. Of course, it's nothing like now where people have millions of dollars at auctions, but they were making a living in their work to come and speak and talk to our artists. Those skills that we developed and that information were transferable. And I went from the seed of program to develop a job learning <laughs> coaching course called Artists in the Marketplace for them. And that was in 1981 and it still exists in almost the identical form that I placed it in. And I'm saying this because once given a chance and an opportunity to be in the community to experiment, not only with your work, but as an administrator, you gain skills that are carried on through life. So this program, CETA, is growing. It's still growing. It is live. The, the, the grant or the contract is not, but the spirit and the knowledge continues. And that is critical. And that's all I have to say <laughs> for now. Questions are welcome. Well, all right. That's, uh, that's plenty. That puts it into uh, perspective. Um, we're going to you know, bring this back to Ted to take us uh, on a... Uh, space launch into the future where where CETA is now in the new programs that are being developed. Before I do that, I want to just uh, mention the Whitney Biennial. Um, first, that uh, Ted's son Jonathan has an extraordinary exhibit that I think is pure poetry uh, set up there on the on the sixth floor. And also that uh, um, Steve Cannon and his gathering of the tribes, which had a lot to do with uh, with CETA during those early days there, um, is has a, his couches there, you can sit on it. And um, that one of the CETA artists, uh, Norman Pritchard, who was, what an amazing force of poetry, this uh, uh, black poet who nobody has heard of. Now we're hearing about him and you can see his, his uh, one of his uh, books hand painted. I didn't even know he did this kind of work. He was, he was his conceptual uh, concrete poetry 
well was is is was is what we were talking about back then. I didn't know he did this, but it's up there on exhibition. So that's just to show you how Sita continues even on the walls yeah. of the museums, etc. And now to talk about tomorrow, Ted Berger, man of the future. Um, th thank you, and thanks for the shout out for Jonathan. Um, I I I just want to. Uh, highlight some of the things that have been said already. It is really important to remember that the New York City CEDA Artist Project was the only CEDA Artist Project throughout the country that gave time to the artists where they were paid. That one day a week. And I think it it's inherent with the what Joan, Joan pointed out about valuing what people uh, are doing, respecting artists and artists as artists. It, it is certainly vital that we understand the critical role that artists play as ambassadors to, to non-arts communities. But unless we are concerned about the making of the work and, and what the artist him or herself needs, it, 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 it's not gonna work. Let me tell you what I see as some trends. And I, I am blessed that I'm still around, but also I've been part of a lot of what I think is a momentum mm -hmm. about these CETA-like projects. One of the things that is important for me and maybe important for others politically is as was already said, you need to remember that both WPA and CEDA were about all sectors. It wasn't just about artists or arts administrators. This was about everybody was in economic trouble and, and everybody needed work. And that changes what the conversation is about. When it's an arts only conversation, then a lot of, in my opinion, of the, of the general public doesn't get what we're talking about. Okay. However, there is a momentum going on and some of us have been trying to push this uh, uh, up the hill for, for a long time. Um, it's, mm -hmm. if you think back every time there is an administrative change in Washington and people think there's going to be uh, a new agenda, there's always this push to get another kind of jobs program off the ground. So uh, when Obama was elected, for example, um, if you know the work of Arlene Goldbard, Arlene wrote about the new WPA. Arlene had been involved in the creation of a California See the Artist project. So that momentum was continuing. With the Biden administration and all the discussion about infrastructure, there has been a tremendous push. There is more legislation right now pending or lost someplace in the bowels of Washington mm -hmm. about giving work to artists than we've ever had before. Um, some of it is WPA-like, some of it is more community-oriented. How much of that will ever rise is unclear as every so much else in Washington is unclear. In, in New York City, um, also two things have happened to this country in, in terms of um, there was the economic recovery funds that came into um, every community and obviously the worldwide pandemic. The worldwide pandemic and the issues that it raised about essential workers brought to those of us involved in our sector, the reality of how fragile 
um, the, the very people who make the arts work, makers and, and other kinds of cultural workers who bring the work to the public, the fragility of their lives became all too apparent. And while there were very important um, relief efforts that were put in place that helped people put band-aids on the hemorrhaging, more and more the conversation has been about systemic challenges that come with both the episodic income issues as well as the either the lack of a safety net or the holes in the safety net. So more and more, you're hearing people say, what are we going to do about the larger issues of work and how an artist sustains her or his career throughout a lifetime? And when monies came into New York City, and New York State actually, and then New York City, at the end of the um, uh, uh, de Blasio administration, there was a group of us that started to really push, could we do a jobs program again? Gonzalo, um, who was then Commissioner of Cultural Affairs, is a major fan of CEDA. And Gonzalo really wanted this to happen. It was very complicated because the money had to get shoveled out very quickly from the city. But what did emerge was not a jobs program, but it was a grants program, which became the New York City Artist Corps. And 3,000 artists received I think it was $5,000 to do various kinds of public projects. That set the stage for something, okay? Both thinking about scale, thinking about um, what artists could do in communities. And for the first time, there was some budgetary attention being paid to our workforce. It was only about artists and it was only about, and not about administrators, but it was still an important statement. I think it was a $25 million commitment. Okay. In the background, throughout the country, there was starting to be, and there still are, these initiatives that were starting in different communities. So if you know the work of Rachel Chanov, for example, from um, Mass Mocha and The Office, Rachel had started some projects uh, around in, in Western Mass and now is working in uh, Mississippi and in another part of the country. Um, that was a, a variation on a WPA CETA-like project. More and more, if you're following the economic arguments that are going on about how people work, or in too many cases, don't work, the issue, the subject of guaranteed income has started to surface in our sector as well. So there are now different parts of the country experimenting with guaranteed income discussions. Mm -hmm. a, a project at Yerba Buena uh, was about guaranteed income. Um, a springboard for the arts in Minnesota was also looking about uh, at a guaranteed income effort. And in Oakland, California, uh, there was both an arts and non-arts guaranteed income approach. Coming back to New York City, New York State, I have been privileged to be part of a, uh, of a group that the Mellon Foundation formed for their new initiative called 
Creatives Rebuild New York. I've been part of a think tank trying to um, work in the development of the program. Uh, uh, Mellon and with Ford, some Ford money in it and uh, Niarco's money in it. Um, this is a $125 million initiative, which has, um, and so the, a, a think tank was formed. What has been exciting for me, as is exciting with conversations like today's, is this has been a cross-generational conversation. It's no longer what I used to call um, uh, like eating a madeleine, some old folks like me getting together and taking a bite of the madeleine, remembering things past. This is like getting um, a shot or a kick in the ass saying, we have work to do and we've got to start to keep this momentum going. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the Mellon Initiative, Creators Rebuild New York is a statewide initiative having two components to it. But there are some other. One will be uh, 2,400 artists are being selected for a guaranteed income initiative. Um, $1,000 a month for 18 months. 300 artists are going to be involved in, um, a, um, in what would be a, a more CETA-like project involving both communities, as well as more time to do your own work if that's what you, if that's what you want. There will also be some basic ideas about how we change the narrative about artists' lives and artists' um, uh, uh, workforce needs. What's exciting is there's a momentum. It is largely in the arts that I'm, I'm looking at the momentum. I wish it were more arts and non-arts together but we'll get there. Yeah. And as I said earlier, these conversations are really about the cross-generational work that needs to be carried on. Mm -hmm. Time and time again, and in, in we've heard the See the Artist Project in New York with CCF had some, there was a lot of uh, hard thinking that went into how we could organize our community, how we could give it muscle and how we could, and how we could think through the complexities of equity um, that are critical. And, and we, it, it, it was a diverse project, there's no question. Look at some of the films, look at some of the pictures. You will see this. But it was diverse in many, many, many other ways as, as well. Um, gender issues, discipline issues, et cetera, was part of that excitement when you were at those payday meetings. You, you, you felt it reflect the city that we, that, that, that we, that we love. Yes. Moving forward, we've got to keep that kind of community organizing and, and ways that we can both respect our differences, but work together that is going to keep this, this going. It's not going to be easy, but I do think there's a momentum building. And I think the Mellon Initiative, uh, Creators Rebuild New York, look, it'll make its own mistakes. And I'm not going to say that, it, uh, that it's going to be perfect. But given a $125 million commitment being made by some major funders with a commitment that they want to really push this idea along is very important. We have to recognize that some of these issues can't be done by just the private sector, that we probably are going to need some public-private partnerships, but we're going to have to figure out how we get government much more on board um, in the next phase of things. 
So there's plenty of work to be done. Roll up your sleeves. You got a hell of a lot of work to do. Oh, Ted. Yes. Yes. Um, Joan, did you want to pop in here? Um, I could. <laughs> I, I am just kind of overwhelmed with Ted's yeah. uh, talk because I couldn't agree with you more. Ted's and and uh, it's just how can we organize that kind of energy and that kind of, you know, you know, equality it, and make it happen now from what we know, from what we've learned. From what we've learned. That's exactly it. Yeah. Well, I think the next step is for us to get to the audience here because uh, that's where the energy is with you guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, so can we turn it back to you, Carolyn and Nick, and see where we go to from here? I want to thank this gorgeous panel. Yeah, this really carries it. And George, I want George un unmuted, please, so he can jump in <laughs> on this. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. We, we did, would love to turn it to you, George, if um, you wanted to unmute and, I don't know, add or ask anything. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, well, I think one of the things I, I enjoyed about the program was the lifelong um, change that it caused in my life and in many of our lives in the way that we thought of uh, working as individual artists. I found for myself that the the fact that we worked as a as a large group was a benefit to my way of thinking outside of the project that came in handy when i had to deal with uh, uh making a living uh in the business world and watching the administrators administer artists I, I learned a great deal about how to administer myself so that I was able to uh, uh, gain a sense of self-worth that came from the project and the work I did there. And it's lasted a lifetime. I also found that uh, the relationships that I that I gained through CETA, again, lasted a lifetime. Many of the people, uh, artists I, I worked th with there are still friends. And we, we often collaborate on, on projects so that the, the effects of CETA was lifelong. It wasn't just two years. Mm -hmm. It was something that changed one's perspective on how to think and how to work with others. And I think that was a key uh, uh, element for me, that it was something I have. I, have, I just met a friend who, who uh, I he went to the exhibit and he said, oh, but I, co I couldn't I couldn't do that because I, I, uh, I can't work with others. And I told him, well, then you're, you're losing out on it. You're losing out on the on the thought processes and working methods of other people that you, you can now incorporate into your own. So it's not a loss, it's a gain. So I think when, when we start thinking of, of, um, of ourselves as not just me, but a we, we gain, you know? So that's what my little two, two cents, yeah. George, I, I would just like to comment, but I don't want to monopolize the, the moment. This, this idea of artists thinking about how their attitudes change, I think is critical to moving forward. Mm -hmm. So for example, earlier it was mentioned, you know, this idea that artists are isolated from the community is this old thing going back probably to the Renaissance that, th that there was this idiosyncratic genius mm -hmm. separated from the world, okay? Um, that stay, has stayed with people and people like the idea that they are both idiosyncratic and geniuses, mm -hmm. but it's not the way most people think. If you also think about uh, how artists love the idea of being independent contractors, right? 
One, because they, they have little money, so they need all the money they can get to begin with. But they really like the idea of independence. And nobody's going to control me. Well, what that does is separate artists and cultural workers from the from a, a larger workforce. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it, it happens that it, we're in a gig economy, and more and more people's lives are going to be like artists' lives. But there, there you have the opportunity for coalition building and for moving ahead politically. Um, so so the, I think there's a lot of rethinking that artists need to do about some of these old ideas of where artists and are in terms of labor. Yep. They work 24 seven, but many don't like to see it in the, in the same labor union terms that, and community organizing terms um, that I, I think are needed to move forward. Oh, can I just say something, Ted? It was my observation that you're absolutely right. And that if you told artists you have to clock in and clock out every day, they would get probably very anxious. However, in the CEDAR program, I saw very little abuse of the actual employment that they did have, as long as you gave them enough space to organize their day and their practice and their time, right. they all came through. Um, they went to work. So it's an interesting comment you're making because it needs to be balanced and given enough independence and enough structure and respect to make it move forward. Right. And thank you, Ted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. I see that Ade has entered the room and uh, he's a guy that we should uh, go to uh, after Jorge. So let's have, can we get to, to, uh, to Ade's uh, window? Yeah, I think he's connecting to the audio. So I'll probably give him a oh. second to adjust to the Zoom world. Um, okay, meanwhile, we're looking for questions, right? Yeah, we have a bunch that came in. So oh, we have a bunch? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, we've got okay. some questions. Um, Michael, if you're with us and can unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, Michael Kresswitz. Maybe. There he is. Cool. Hi, everybody. Excellent conversation. Um, so we just uh, last week we just finished the application for the Creatives Rebuild New York program. I'm on Long Island, and uh, a lot of our conversation was about how we're going to structure. So basically, it's a two-year the two-year grant working with an arts organization, and we were trying to figure out you know just exactly what we would do, and. Uh, one of the things we were talking about is whether we should have like, uh, like a yearly event or something like that and build everything yeah. towards the yearly event. Or, you know, my thing was thinking about doing like small workshops, work go, doing outreach to the community, working in senior centers and not really having a goal in mind. And the other people were saying, no, we should have this big arts event or something. So I was wondering how you guys structured your programs. And the other thing I was wondering is when we we're going to do the interviews next. So the artists are going to be interviewed individually. Is there some kind of like conversation that should be in the interview to kind of promote the idea of what we're going to do as a group? I don't know. If that's too vague. You know, it's like we're trying to figure out what the approach is should what what should we do in the two years? How how do we build this thing from from nothing? We're not really we're not really having an organization that's already up and running. We're looking to build something from scratch. Ted, do you notice any of that uh, you know interior stuff here that Michael's talking about? I I I can't really comment on. Oh, okay. Whoops. That. Sorry. Okay. Well, you're going to have to flip a coin, Michael, obviously, <laughs> or maybe you can get the group to, to go along with you. That was to be my two suggestions. Yeah, George wants to say yeah, something. What, what I found helpful with CETA was they had, in the beginning, they had a meeting of showing all the artists involved 
in the in in the program and what many of us did as as, as part of the uh, documentary unit was to take note of artists that we were interested in or organizations that we were interested in and then uh, link up with them and then start to build relationships uh, with with other artists as well as with the uh, perhaps other organizations so that you have you you begin to you begin to have the artists interacting with each other and and um, and and um, working together in in various different projects that you you don't have if you don't introduce them to to themselves. So that's my suggestion. Just let the artists meet each other. There you go. And from there, a seed will grow. Yeah. Okay. I agree. Thank you, Michael. That gets us right into it. Thank you. Thank you. The, look, um, Adamola, you're just showing up, but uh, we can throw the microphone at you or you can join in our, at, 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 at your pleasure. What would you like to do here, great CETA artist? Unmute and let us hear you. You should be able to unmute, Adamola. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm listening. So, uh, so I'm, I just kind of tuned in now. So I really don't know the. Okay. The, well, let's just go back to the questions then, Ade. And you just uh, join in wherever, okay? Sure. Back, back to you, Carolyn. Great. Um, so we'd like to turn it to Nancy Solomon next. Um, feel free to unmute, ask your question. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to hear a little bit, you know, from the people who are in the CETA program. What was like one of your most powerful memories of doing a program, doing something in the community? You know, because, you know, a lot of times those memories are really what help, you know, all of us, you know, continue the work that we're doing. I'm a folklorist, but I work with a lot of traditional artists. So I'd, Kind of like to hear what one of those moments was where you were like, oh, I'm so glad I can do this. Well, working working with the poets and in the senior uh, senior center, it was really fantastic because the senior, uh, first they welcome, they welcome you, they were excited about what you were working with them. And uh, Sometimes we will do a, once a month a birthday, you know, for the all, all of them. We will make masks. We used to do dancing. The poets used to do the poetry. Sometimes we encourage them to do poetry also. So, you know, um, it's, it's also engaging the public in that sense, you know, and you're teaching them a few things where they can express themselves, you know, whether with materials or with, you know, with writing or, you know, and then photographing all of that is really fantastic. Also, uh, also with children, you know, doing workshops, going into the community, finding out through different sections that you have, you will find out what problems the community have too, that you could also like unite them and you will unite with them uh, in terms of solving it or trying to give ideas and stuff like that so that they could talk to each other, you know, it, it, it create that sense of community. That was very, very important. Uh, and also, you know, working with other artists that were doing, like in my case, they were doing murals in different spaces, you know what I mean? If they needed some kind of technical assistant, if you knew about certain things, other artists would know about it, you will find out. There was that type of collaboration, you know, of experimenting, well, this work that doesn't work, you know what I mean? Try this and all of that. We usually, you don't get every day, but with the CETA Artist Project, we did that. And to this day, uh, you know, like you make like Jorge Malave said, you make those connections and you still keep those connections and you're still doing that, you know, and talking to each other. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, that is what a community is. It's a community of artists. It's a community with a community that you're working in. It's the different organizations, you know what I mean? Uh, 
having seen those per perspectives um, is, is really fantastic. You know, you learn to move around. Remember, artists have an eye in, in, for social, for capturing social situations. Why? Because they're always looking for things, either for a painting, for a print, whatever. And they are usually the first one. That's why they like to have their independence because you cannot, you cannot tell them how to think or whatever, you know, they always say whatever they're gonna say and they don't care. You know, they, they, they go with their wisdom and the, the inside wisdom that they have and, and they just throw it out there. They're very knowledgeable people. You also tend to work by yourself sometimes to do certain projects because it's a communication between you and the piece. So you have different ways of moving within the world out there. You know what I mean? And the artists are really great for this. And people could learn that and be more compassionate when they see things that are really uh, bad or, 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 or good. You know, that's, it's all part of it. You know, positive and negative is part of, of the world. So we, we have to unite within, with all of that. You know what I mean? It's very positive. This new an initiative of creative, Liberalizing the arts is, is a fantastic movement that is going to happen. And I have a lot of faith in it because I have faith in the artists. I have faith in the artists. We have to have faith in the artists. You'll see what's going to happen. So, you know, th that's all I have to say. I don't know. But have faith and let the wisdom come out. You know, it's, it's important. I think art, art seems to be a way of transforming people as well as, uh, as, well as yourself. And with each, uh, with each work that is created by, your, by, uh, by yourself as well as community, there's a small change that takes place and they, they bring that home. And, I, and I, was, I was taken by the fact that many of the people who were taking advantage of the artists in the classes and and uh, and in, in, in learning in the learning uh, um, uh, sessions? They 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 you can see the transformation in the class as it happened. All of a sudden, someone who's very quiet will will burst out and 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 open up, or they'll <laughs> go home enthused to to start a new project. So you saw it, you saw what the artists were doing directly into the community. And that, and those things happened little by little and they're often ignored. But if you do that often enough, uh, and I think two years actually for a program is not enough. It takes you about a year to just settle down, another year to get going, and maybe another year to sort of move back and let somebody else come in. So I think a three-year period is more is more uh, uh, conducive to a program like this. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I would totally agree with my uh, colleagues uh, that number one, uh, an extended, more extended time would be helpful and useful. But my fondest memories was uh, something that was just echoed, uh, and that is the transformative uh, work that we did, that art is, in fact, uh, was so rewarding. Uh, several of the projects that I worked on were uh, working with younger people, and uh, there's something magic about the, uh, the the, the change in attitude that you discern from many of them as they get into the art. I think it was just reflected in my colleague when they said you see the, the, the change in their, their eyes and the way they look at the world. And that is so very true. Uh, one of the biggest projects, and Ted uh, was with me on this, when we went into a school and we transform the auditorium uh, by involving really just a large portion of all of the students in the school in reconstructing or 
the, the curtains for the stage. And that was very important because, you know, everybody goes to the auditorium to some kind of program. And um, we actually created what we call the, uh, we called it the color spectrum curtains where we uh, use different color fabrics to create a kind of a, a gra gradual uh, a color spectrum. And uh, it was just so appreciated. Uh, the students participated from the beginning, from uh, helping to choose the colors and the fabric and then the sewing and the actual then uh, installation. That was a tremendous, tremendous transformative, transformative, I'm sorry, uh, project. And then other things that we did were, were classrooms uh, where I spoke to uh, older, uh, uh, you know, older adults who uh, had never really interacted with an artist or a creative person in that capacity. And that was very rewarding because, you know, one of the things I think people forget is that um, some of the, the transformation that happens within people's psyche is not always discernible right away. So what we did 50 years ago is still resonating with the way we change people's perception of the world and perception of the, the creative process. And actually, uh, a lot of people, I think, gain faith in government in the sense that uh, they knew that we were being sponsored by, by their taxpayers' money, and we were there to serve them. So, uh, you know, there were just so many good things that came out of it. It was, some, uh, it was an awesome, um, results, I think, that we're still probably feeling today. Thanks so much, Adamola, for joining in there. Um, we just wanted to turn it also to uh, Katrina Jeffries. Um, to Hi, Katrina. <laughs> hey, Adamola. Hi, Ted. Um, okay. I just want to say that it's super important. I'm an artist, but I've also had the honor of working in the entertainment industry for over 40 years, and I'm a union member. So those two things of being an artist and the emphasis that is put on the individuality of the artist and what someone mentioned before that we do often work alone, but then we also have to find a place where we can come together collaboratively and you know, working in a union and attending union meetings and uh, going to collective bargaining sessions with my employers um, expands the way that you think about your place in that whole cosmology. And I think this is this is important for artists is that we we this all of these programs are super important for artists because we really have to understand the place that we have in the economy and in the in the community, right? So, it is no matter if we think we're, we are individuals, but we must always understand that there's a collective that we might have to work within to support each other and to, and to be successful. So um, I'm happy for um, this program from New York State. It's really brilliant. Um, it's not something that I was interested in, but um, it, it wasn't for me, but so many of my friends are applying for it. And, um, and I just hope that we can find a way to support each other in a more collaborative spaces. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katrina, yeah, for adding on there. Um, and so now we'd love to turn it to our very own Fong for a final statement question. Thank you so much, Ted. Thank you so much, Ted. I mean, Bob, everyone here, really, Katrina, Joan, Molly, um, Jody, it's uh, George. I think that um, there's something incredibly worrisome. I, I, you know, as I remember reading uh, Richard Rorty, one of the great, the last philosopher of pragmatism, he wrote this book. Uh, I think it was in 1998, it's called Achieving Our Country, where he really took a serious examination between the split 
among the cultural left and the reformist left. Meaning in 1975, when the war in Vietnam ended, there was a terrible collective acknowledgement, recognition that there were a million Vietnamese were killed, you know, 300 something American were killed. There was no acknowledgement at all from Washington DC. As you remember um, that one of the great you know, policy maker of containment was George F. Kennan, who even warned against the war in Vietnam. Uh, they wouldn't listen to him. But the point was that when the war ended, it seemed to be like a psychological blow. All those people went to the academy immediately. <laughs> they went to the academy. And I think that was so interesting, as I remember reading it when it came out, there was certain strange seduction towards you know, French post-structuralist uh, philosophy, which very interestingly, our friend, uh, we just pay a tribute to our late friend, Sylvain Lachinger, who brought it here actually, when he was a young philosopher um, or professor of philosophy at Columbia University, even him have acknowledged it. There was a very strange fixation on French structuralist philosophy which they misread it entirely and kept to themselves as a kind of their own creation in the academy. And it oftentimes why they have a certain, you know, useful insight about social ills. It's nevertheless were ever, ever accessible, made into in terms of materialized to working class people, forget about artists, working class artists and thinker and culture work and whatnot. So the reforming, reforming mislev, the one that was more committed to the idea as you all describe here, Ted, when you talk about the community, I can't really help but bring up the again from the get-go as I'm <laughs> beginning reading, rereading um, as Alexis Tocqueville, when he wrote um, The Marxist in America, he was 26 years old. The first volume were published in 1835, the other was 1840. And what he stressed on the most important that have a profound effect on Whitman, uh, Thoreau, Emerson, all the way to Dewey, of course, Rory and those people, was the art of joining, Bob. The art of joining, very important that he stressed on why the word for philanthropy means to love people and why in America, is so different than European. The, the amazing work ethic of, among the Americans is exactly so impressive as he observed, six days the work they would work. And they don't like people to mess with their properties, you know? I mean, I, I rewatch uh, Daniel Day-Lewis film recently, there will be uh, blood. I mean, you know, you when you work so hard, you create your land, you don't want people to come around and tell you what to do. But to, my point is on the seventh day, they get together. They create the whole idea of town, the town hall idea, come together. And then they would discuss among themselves, those who have uh, made more money than the other would, uh, you know, offer to build a church for the community, build school for children, and whatnot. And I think that's exactly what happened to Democratic Vistas when Will Whitman talked about that same idea when he wrote in response to Thomas Carlyle's um, awful criticism of American democracy. And what he talked, two things that stood out to me very distinctly. One is that it has to be a social process. It cannot be perceived as the political process, democracy, social process. People have to come together, support each other, just like the order of joining that Tocqueville insisted so early on. Uh, and the other thing is a cultural process in which worker, culture worker, poets like him, writers, artists, have to be sure to provide and make accessible what they created, the culture, the, you know, the work of art and whatnot, accessible to everyone, particularly working class people. And that has been lost. It has been lost. 
And what you've been talking here is exactly the reason, the sole reason why the Brooklyn Railroad created wow. the first place. You know, when October 2000, I was very mindful that it has to be October for everybody, not October for elite intellectual. And it had to be free so that it have direct access to everyone, to all reader, not discriminatory at whatsoever. And the last thing I want to stress is that um, I think you are absolutely right. We, we are on that moment now where if we don't get together and do what we do, um, I think we're gonna experience more tightening of the bureaucratic rigidity that provide more uh, means, justification for tyrannical people. And I think the, this is where we can be super useful as arsenal against any kind of measure of oppressive means whatsoever. I think that's exactly what we are experiencing now in Ukraine with Putin and Russia and whatnot. And I think this is the time where you are absolutely right, Ted. This is the time where the humanity counts. Exactly what Black Death gave birth to the Renaissance. After all, Renaissance means rebirth. And it was the artist, the poet, the philosopher, the, the humanist who came together and recreate that sense of what Whitman called cosmic optimism. And I think it's true in the 30s too. It was the art humanity that healed. So I'm so grateful to you all because this is exactly where we are at because the wisdom of what you've done, Bob, you know, Ted and all of you have been there. It's so important for the younger group of generation, mine and the younger one, Hopefully, once we put in YouTube, it will have different life, and they get to 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 be they ready to get on the the baton that you passed on because this is so important. Continuity of historical knowledge had to be as just as aggressive as the one that the people who have tyrannical tendency seem to know how to exploit history for the same reason. So thank you so much. Grazie mille. Thank you, Fang. Thanks so much. Um, what an amazing conversation. I've learned so, so much. We do have a tradition at the rail of ending our events with a poetry reading, and we have the pleasure of our host being a obviously wonderful poet himself. So, Bob, if you'd like to close us out with something, that'd be great. Yeah. I would, of course, I, first I want to do a little bit of prelude to what well, I can't shut up, right? But to Fong, just to say that uh, when I was lucky enough to be in Eritrea in the year 2000, when Eritrea was a utopian poetic place, reminding me of Nicaragua when the Sandinistas just came in, um, I learned that there, of the nine languages in uh, Eritrea, all of them share the same word for joiner. And joiner does not mean like it means when you first hear it in English, to join. Oh, he's a joiner. Wants a person who jumps from church to church, I guess their conversion don't mean too much kind of thing. No, um, a joiner is a person who brings things together. And that's what Fong's talking about. And that's what Sita is about, you know, is bring I, a, a community of artists, laughable, essential, you know. And as far as the answer to who, who I loved working with quickly, um, I was the scribe for the Village Halloween Parade. I'm still friends with Ralph Lee and work with him. I was the oral historian for the St. Mark's Poetry Project, still totally engaged with those folks. And down at the Henry Street Settlement when I was working with the uh, children's uh, uh, poetry uh, program there, the five-year-olds and six-year-olds, we wrote all our poems in the air, thanks to Kenneth Koch and his great poem for child, poems for children um, learning system. Um, and when, when we'd written the book, I said to the kids, well, what should we call it? And this one kid sh shouted out, we should call it, the rainbow raises its shoulder when a flower grows. And I said, Okay, and that was that, you know, that was that. Okay, I'm gonna close with a couple of poems by Siri Shadan. 
uh, you know, friend of uh, the Ukrainian community here in New York. He's in Kharkiv. He is on the front line. Yesterday he was in a in a car getting some beer and there was a rocket that came in front of the car. So we're thinking about you, Siri Jadon. Here's two poems. The first one is called, So What Does This Man Do? The translation from the Ukrainian by Verlana Tkach, who is the director of the Yara Arts uh, program that is, you know, La Mama's Ukrainian branch and Wanda Phipps, great poet. So what does this man do? He writes poems spreads them out on the table, polishes them as if getting shoes ready for a child. Just in time, sits down to work, gets to the point, soon winter will come and men will take the poems, sift through them gently like dry tobacco and women will cry over them, carefully wrapping them like gold coins. The value of a poem grows in the winter time, especially if the winter is hard, especially if the language is soft, especially if the times are mad. Okay, this other poem, uh, uh, which is uh, from, uh, uh, there's new the series new uh, book uh, from Yale called uh, "What We Live For, What We Die For." Um, it's called Headphones. Sasha, a quiet drunk, an esoteric, a poet, spent the entire summer in the city. When the shooting began, he was surprised. Started watching the news, then stopped. He walks around the city with headphones on, listening to golden oldies as he stumbles into burned out cars, blown up bodies. What will survive from the history of the world in which we lived will be the words and music of a few geniuses who desperately tried to warn us, tried to explain, but failed to to explain anything or save anyone. These geniuses lie in cemeteries and out of their rib cages grow flowers and grass. Nothing else will remain, only their music and songs, a voice that forces you to love. Now, you can choose to turn off this music, listen to the cosmos, Shut your eyes. Think about whales in the ocean at night. Hear nothing else. See nothing else. Feel nothing else, except, of course, for the smell, the smell of corpses. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Siri Jadon. And we stand with Ukraine. Thank you, Bob. That was a beautiful choice. Um, yeah, we found a, a link that Can there. I... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Without art, there's no culture. <laughs> totally. Yes. <laughs> Complete. Thank you, Nitsa. Um, thank you all so much, Ted, Molly, um, Joan, Jody, uh, George, Adam Mola for joining, um, everyone at City Lore and Artists Alliance Inc. Um, as I said, the show at Coochie Free Dose is closed, but the one at City Lore has been extended to April 10th, so definitely go see it if you haven't. Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. And um, please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Rona Pondick and Jessica Holmes, and we'll conclude with a poetry reading by Jennifer Bonilla Edgington. And um, you can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Keep up the good work. Bye. Bye. They will. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Go Ted. See Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you Molly and Jody. Bye, Joan. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much.
Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Jody. Thanks, John. Thank you so much. G. E. Schwartz. Been a pleasure. Thanks, G. Hey, Cal. Woohoo. Doing. Good to see you. Thank you. Can't see you. Well, it's time to bring out the martinis, Fawn. Bye. Thank you. All right. Thank Good you. afternoon, everybody. Love Take you care. guys. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Cedar. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Stay safe. Cheers, Cheers everyone. Hey. Bye. Bye.